sorry, just a little interruption there. <laughs> um, uh, and in fact, uh, inhibitory control uh, is a bit of a sort of problem child when we talk about executive functions. Uh, because it often either loads onto uh, sort of one general executive function factor or individual tasks do not uh, cohere into a single factor at all. Uh, so for this reason, I think uh, it's important to um, unpack the construct a little uh, and take a look at the sort of different types of inhibitory control that have been described in the literature. And this will then in turn help situate uh, the research I'm going to present to you today. So a commonly uh, studied type of inhibitory control in early childhood um, is the ability to delay gratification or follow a prohibition. And this typically involves a situation where the child is either told explicitly not to do something that they want to do or has to wait uh, to receive a larger reward. And I like to refer to this uh, as, as temptation-based inhibitory control. And this type of inhibitory control is also closely linked to uh, what is often called hot executive functioning. So basically uh, executive functioning involving a situation that is emotionally or motivationally charged. Another type um, of inhibitory control is interference control. This is a more uh, cognitive or cool type of inhibitory control that involves performing a, a cognitive task while ignoring distraction. And this distraction often involves a high level of perceptual conflict. Then we have a response inhibition, uh, which involves overcoming a strong habitual or prepotent response tendency, typically a, a motor response. And then we have a group of inhibitory functions, uh, cognitive inhibition, uh, negative priming and automatic inhibition of attention. And these all involve some kind of uh, priming or cueing effects, um, either in memory or in visual attention. And here, um, the cued material is distracting and must be ignored to focus on the relevant information. And in most instances, this is a, an effortful process. So for example, ignoring distracting items in working memory. Uh, but some kinds of, of, uh, of inhibition happen automatically, especially within the domain of visual attention. And finally, we have a behavioral inhibition. Uh, this is a very different kind of uh, inhibition. It refers to a sort of a reluctance uh, or shyness in social context. So it's not really the typical sort of full inhibitory control where you really need to control your behavior. It's more of um, a sort of temperament or personality trait but it nevertheless involves uh, inhibited behavior. And you will find uh, many more uh, definitions in the literature and uh, many more nuances at, um, of this construct. So this is really just to give you uh, an overview of, um, of just how multidimensional uh, inhibitory control is. Okay, uh, so one of the things I've been interested in for a long time is how we can best measure inhibitory control across early development. So following on from uh, my early work um, looking at inhibitory control in infancy, I was really frustrated by the lack of inhibitory control tasks and executive function tasks uh, more generally for infants and toddlers, because this made it really hard to study individual developmental trajectories over time. And in my view, um, the tasks, um, um, uh, or in my view, really the issue is that the tasks that we use in infancy, toddlerhood, and early childhood differ substantially in design. So quite often we use uh, one task um, at one age and then a completely different task at the next stage. And I believe that these structural differences make it difficult to make sure that we're measuring the same function across. Um, so, so what I did was I basically set out to develop um, a new task battery uh, to measure inhibitory control and other executive functions across the transition between infancy and early childhood. And this is an age where we really know uh, relatively little about inhibitory. But I'm not the only person who's been uh, thinking about and working on solving these difficulties uh, with assessing inhibitory control. So others research, other researchers have also uh, proposed solutions. And I'm going to just briefly discuss uh, two of these proposals. Okay, so, so Carlson in 2005 um, used a large uh, battery of um, or a large data executive function data set uh, from children aged between two and six years. This was um, 
um, across multiple studies, both published and unpublished. And she used this data set, she reanalyzed this data set in order to provide our recommendations for task difficulty for each task in the executive function battery uh, at ages two, three, four, and five to six years. And I think this uh, data-driven approach to task selection is very uh, useful, particularly for researchers who uh, want to design uh, an executive function battery for specific aid. But um, as I mentioned before, um, there is um, one of the limitations of this, um, of this approach is that um, uh, different tasks are used at different ages, and this makes it really hard uh, to make cross-age comparisons. Another limitation uh, of this work is that all executive function tasks are mixed together in this kind of task difficulty ranking. So if you wanted to focus uh, more specifically on inhibitory control, it's, it's sort of mixed in among all the other executive and finally, uh, there was limited coverage of the youngest ages. But more recently, uh, Peterson and colleagues have also highlighted uh, the problem uh, with inhibitory control tasks for young children being uh, useful across a limited age range. So these researchers conducted um, a large uh, meta-analysis of studies looking um, at inhibitory uh, control development. And what they found was that each individual task uh, was only really useful uh, across uh, two and a half years during development. These authors um, also propose that inhibitory control has what's called heterotypic continuity. Uh, and this is basically the idea that, inhibit uh, that inhibitory control exists as the same function over development, but its behavioral expression changes over time. And the solution uh, that Peterson and colleagues uh, proposed in terms um, of assessment is to use an overlapping uh, measurement approach within, within a longitudinal structural equation modeling framework. So if you imagine having a, a battery of inhibitory control tasks, uh, Peterson and colleagues basically propose to keep in each task across multiple age points for, for as long time as, uh, as possible really, but to then gradually replace tasks when, the, uh, when these tasks are no longer age appropriate, ideally only one at a time. And I think this is, um, this is a really elegant solution. I, I really like this idea, uh, but it does have uh, some limitations. One of those limitations is that uh, structural equation modeling requires uh, large sample sizes. It's, it's not always feasible, especially with very, very young participants. Um, and also, um, as Peterson and colleagues uh, point out uh, themselves, uh, this approach doesn't actually guarantee construct validity invariance, which just means that it doesn't guarantee that we're measuring the same uh, function uh, across age. Um, in order to establish that, um, there's no way around the sort of gradual process of construct validation. So we have to continue uh, validating our tasks to make sure that they measure what they were developed to measure. Um, and um, uh, finally, a limitation of both of these papers is that they focused on inhibitory control tasks uh, for children over two years of age. Okay, so my proposal is that we try and keep inhibitory control tasks as consistent as possible across age. It still doesn't guarantee that we're measuring the same thing, but I think it's more likely. Uh, and provided that we adjust the tasks to be age appropriate and we see a good range of individual differences at each age, I think it could be a useful approach. Okay, so I'm going uh, to present some work to you on um, the development of an inhibitory control task, which I believe is structurally similar across age. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to just highlight which type of inhibitory control that this task was developed to measure. So among uh, all of these different um, aspects of inhibitory control, um, in this work, I focused specifically on the development of response. Okay, so let's take a look at the development of response inhibition. As I mentioned uh, before, response inhibition is the ability to stop a highly practiced or prepotent response. Uh, we have two classic tasks uh, which are commonly used to assess uh, response inhibition, the go-no-go -no -go task and the stop signal task. In the go-no-go -no -go task, participants have to um, uh, respond when they, whenever they see a frequently presented stimulus, so we call that the go stimulus, whereas when they see a less frequent no-go stimulus, they have it, have it responding. 
And the stop signal task is uh, similar. In this task, uh, participants have to perform a forced choice reaction time task, but then occasionally a beep sounds just as they're about to respond and the participant then has to stop themselves from responding. So uh, the, the stop signal task is generally considered a somewhat harder task uh, because the participant has already initiated the response when they have to inhibit. Okay, so on the go, no go task, we see a sort of rapid improvement in performance across um, early childhood. Whereas in the stop signal task, which as I mentioned, is a somewhat a more difficult task, we see a substantial improvement across middle childhood, a peak performance in young adulthood, and then a slight decline in old age. And that's what um, you can see here on this uh, graph uh, from a study by Williams and colleagues, you see this sort of a U-shaped uh, developmental function uh, on the stop signal task across the line. So uh, when we want to assess response inhibition in toddlers, uh, we have the problem that the go-no-go -no -go task and the stop signal task are not suitable for very young children. The children under three years of age struggle with task comprehension and working memory demands. So something that might seem quite simple to an adult, like an if then rule, if you see this, touch, if you see that, don't touch, that's actually quite difficult for a two-year-old to understand. So to address this, we developed the Early Childhood Inhibitory Touchscreen Task, or ACID, which is a simple response inhibition task for infants and toddlers. And the task involves playing an iPad game where the participant has to press one of two buttons depending on which one has a smiley on it. And on 75% of trials, the smiley appears in one location. So we call these the prepotent trials. And here you can see it's at the top. Whereas on 25% of trials, the smiley appears in the other location. And these are the inhibitory trials where the participant has to overcome uh, this prepotent or habitual response tendency that's been built up over the prepotent trials. If the participant uh, presses the correct button, a small reward uh, plays as uh, a small uh, animation plays as a reward. Okay, so here's a little video uh, of my youngest daughter doing a, a few trials of the asset when she was about 22 months old. And I think this video illustrates quite nicely the sort of difficulty that toddlers have with response inhibition. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can see the prepotent location is at the top. And the next trial is an inhibitory trial. You can see some classic perseverative responding, uh, but it does eventually find the correct location. Okay, we also developed a version of the ACID for older children and adults that we call the ACID A to try and create a task that is structurally similar across the lifespan. And in this version, trials are presented faster, there are no animations, uh, participants are asked to bring back their finger to a red dot in the center between trials, and they are also encouraged to respond as fast as possible without making mistakes. So we then used uh, this new task in several studies covering pretty much the whole lifespan. We ran two uh, large studies uh, with infants. Uh, so we had have two samples of 10 month olds. Both samples have um, over 100 10 month old infants uh, in them. And most of these uh, we followed up at 16 months. Uh, we did plan to follow them up until two and a half years, but sadly the pandemic came in the way. Um, and um, in this work, we use the A not B task for validation. We also ran uh, three studies uh, in toddlers, a small uh, pilot study, uh, a cross-sectional uh, study comparing performance of 24 month olds to a performance of 30 month olds, uh, and a longitudinal study uh, where we assessed the same group of children at 18, 21 and 24 months of age also ran a lifespan study where we used uh, the adult version of the task uh, with older children, young adults and older adults. And in this study, we used the stop signal task. And 
finally, we tested um, a large opportunity sample um, at public engagement events. And uh, this uh, picture is just to show you that uh, one of the advantages of having your task on an iPad is that you can test uh, almost anywhere. So here you can see me testing uh, at a street festival in Oxford uh, a couple of years ago. Okay, so in terms of predictions, if um, the asset really measures uh, response inhibition, participants should make more errors on inhibitory trials, and they should have slower reaction times on correct inhibitory trials. Likewise, we expected to see some developmental progression. So younger children, especially infants and toddlers, should again make more errors on inhibitory trials and be slower on correct inhibitory. In terms of validation, on the adult version of the task, we expected to see a similar a U shaped lifespan, a developmental course of response inhibition, as has been seen uh, for the stop signal task by Williams and colleagues. Um, and we also expected performance on that version of the task to correlate directly with stop signal performance. Um, and in infants, we expect that that performance um, on the asset um, would, correlate uh, would correlate with performance on the A not B task. And finally, we hope, hoped um, to replicate the lifespan um, uh, findings, the uh, effects in terms of condition and age effects uh, in the sort of more uh, naturalistic and noisy setting at the public. So uh, let's take a look at the data. So I think that before I started this work, I had never imagined uh, how many children we would end up testing with this task. Uh, but as with most research, we started out uh, with a pilot study. This was a very small study with just 15 toddlers. And at this point in time, we were mainly aiming uh, for a task to be used with children around two years of age. And what we found was that uh, the toddlers did um, actually fairly well on the task, uh, but we did see that they made significantly more errors on the inhibitory condition compared to the prepotent condition. Um, and then uh, we ran a, a cross-sectional study where we uh, compared performance of a group of two-year-olds to a group of two-and-a-half-year-olds. Um, and um, as you can see, um, both of these groups uh, perform uh, pretty well in the prepotent trials, but the two-year-olds struggle significantly more on the inhibitory trials uh, compared to the two-and-a-half-year-olds. So this is really the first indication uh, that there's some kind of developmental progression on the task that is specific to the inhibitory condition. Okay, so uh, since uh, two and two and a half year olds seem to cope fairly well with the task, we decided to try the task uh, with younger toddlers and infants. So here you can see the data from our two uh, 10 month samples. And what you can see um, is that there's a, a substantial um, uh, effect of condition in both samples. So this replicates uh, really nicely. Uh, so basically, 10-month-olds, uh, uh, they still do pretty well in the prepotent trials, but they really uh, struggle on the inhibitory trials, performing really just around chance. And in these studies, we also wanted to assess uh, test-retest reliability. Uh, so some of the infants were retested a week after the first session. And what we found was uh, that there was a modest to moderate uh, test-retest reliability across a one-week period. Um, the test retest was slightly higher for the second sample, which I think is uh, probably because we administered um, a lot more trials in the second session here. Uh, but either way, I think uh, it's encouraging that we see some stability in performance across a one week period at 10 months of age. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the 16 months uh, follow up data. So you can see there's still a substantial effect of condition. Uh, 16 months old still really struggle uh, with the inhibitory trials. And in fact, we see no significant age progression between 10 and 16 months. And we also see no stability in individual uh, performance differences between 10 and 16 months. In terms of associations uh, with the A not B task, which is sort of um, really considered a gold standard inhibitory control task in infancy, we found uh, no uh, significant association between the ACID and the A0B at 10 months, but we did find a moderate association between the two tasks. At and this suggests that by 16 months, the ACID and the A0B tap into a similar function. 
And given that we used a version of the a naught b task that uh, maximizes the inhibitory demand, I think uh, it's fairly safe to assume that the shared function. Okay, so let's take a look at the longitudinal toddler data. So um, on the left here, you can see the graph I showed you before, where we see a no significant um, performance improvement uh, or stability of individual differences in infancy, but this starts to change during toddlerhood. So here we again see a significant effect of condition, but we also start to see some age progression, uh, just as we did uh, in the cross-sectional data. So as you can see, uh, toddler's performance in the prepotent condition is high and stable across age. So it's really in the inhibitory condition that we see the developmental improvement. And this is exactly what we hope to find because it suggests that the task is sensitive to the development of response inhibition, even at this young age. And not only that, we also start to see some significant age to age correlations in terms of performance. And this suggests that individual differences in response inhibition start to stabilize in the second year of life, which is actually a fair bit earlier than what has previously been found. And I think this is uh, promising in terms of starting to track individual differences in inhibitory control from an early age. Okay, so just to give you a, a brief overview of the lifespan data. So here you see the combined results are from the work with older children and adults and also um, the public engagement work. And we did indeed, fi indeed find that performance on the adult version of the task uh, showed um, this uh, U-shaped uh, developmental function across um, the lifespan, which is similar to what has been found uh, for the stop signal task. And we also found that there was a significant, a direct significant uh, correlation between performance on the adult version and the stop signal task. And this was even when controlling uh, for age and simple reaction time. And this shows us that the task has a similar developmental pattern across the lifespan to other uh, response inhibition tasks, and that it likely taps into the same inhibitory function. Okay, so let me just have a sip of water then give you um, a summary of these results. So the early childhood inhibitory touchscreen task is a new response inhibition task. Very simple. All participants have to do is to press the happy. Task can be used from 10 months of age and despite minor modifications to make the task fun for babies and toddlers, it is structurally similar across age. As predicted, Participants ranging in age really from um, infants to older adults make more errors and are slower to respond on inhibitory trials than on prepotent trials. We also found that performance on the task is correlated with performance on more established response inhibition tasks, both in infancy uh, and in older children and adults. And in infancy, although um, the condition uh, effect is really robust, there's no evidence for age progression or longitudinal stability between 10 and 16 months. But this starts to change uh, during toddlerhood where we see a clear developmental progression and emerging stability in task performance between 16 and 24 months. And I think this demonstrates the potential of the task to measure individual differences in response inhibition at an age which uh, is notoriously difficult to assess. Okay, so as with any research, this research has uh, some limitations. Uh, I think the most important thing uh, to point out is that this is only one task. So I'm not claiming uh, that the asset will solve all our difficulties with assessing early inhibitory control. I think we need uh, many more tasks to, uh, to assess inhibitory control in infancy and toddlerhood and to start to establish that continuity of assessment into the later childhood years. Um, also, the ACID is a response inhibition task. It was developed to be a response inhibition task. And at the moment, uh, we don't uh, know how performance on the task relates to other aspects of inhibitory control, although that is something uh, we are looking into in our current work. We need to uh, further develop and further validate the task, uh, especially in the preschool range. And we need to establish stability between the infant and toddler version of the task and the adult version of the task. 
And then I think it's important to highlight that there are other perspectives and, and other proposals for how we should deal uh, with the, the difficulties we have in trying to assess inhibitory control continuously across early development. And in particular, uh, Peterson and colleagues uh, proposed uh, this uh, approach involving gradually changing the tasks in an inhibitory uh, control task battery over time in order to capture the heterotypic continuity of inhibitory control. And on the face of it, it may seem like this is the opposite argument of what I'm proposing, but I actually think that a combination of inhibitory control tasks that retain as much of their structure across age as possible and Peterson and colleagues overlapping measurement approach would be the ideal. And uh, finally, really my, um, my aim with um, all of this work uh, with the ESSET is to uh, provide a useful tool for investigating longitudinal trajectories in early inhibitory control development, especially during infancy and toddlerhood. So if we can start to relate um, those early trajectories to later key outcomes, uh, such as more complex executive function skills, academic achievement, and later social development. But before I finish, um, I'd like to say a little bit about what we're up to now, what we have in the pipeline. Uh, so Alex Henry is uh, finishing up a paper that looks at uh, associations between different types of inhibitory control in infancy. And this includes more temptation-based uh, inhibitory control measures, as well as um, some aspects of behavioral inhibition. And Abby Fisk is uh, about to submit a paper that looks at the neural substrate, um, sorry, that looks at the neural substrate of response inhibition in infancy using functional near-infrared spectroscopy. So in this study, um, we measured brain activity in 10-month-old infants while they performed the ESSET. We are really excited about the results, but uh, I'm not going to reveal uh, anything here because uh, Abby will be presenting this data uh, at some other events later this year. Do look out for the preprint, which uh, hopefully we will ha have up by the end of this month. Uh, and finally, um, we are hoping to get back to testing babies and toddlers again and doing some more longitudinal research um, as you can see, uh, we did try, we were back before Christmas and we saw uh, three toddlers in the lab and then we had to shut everything down again for the third lockdown. Uh, but I think things are looking a little more hopeful for the summer. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, my team and collaborators who've all contributed to this work. Um, and of course, uh, our families who have participated in this research uh, and uh, without them, uh, I really wouldn't have had anything to present to you today. So thank you to them too. Uh, thank you so much, Carla. That was a, a fascinating talk and really nice to see your development um, across a number of tasks. And I particularly like your um, data-driven approaches as well. That was really quite interesting. Uh, I did post into the, the chat, Carla, your, uh, your preference for questions in person, albeit face-to-face uh, -face online. So I'm going to open up now the, the floor for questions. So please feel free to pop on your videos and mics and we will go through that process of um, questioning. I have a question. May yep. I jump in? Go for your life, Rebecca. Great. Thank you, Carla. That was really interesting. It was everything I hoped it would be. Um, so I just had a question. You, you said that you you looked at how this the performance on this task relates to other measures of inhibitory control. Yeah. And also that you wanted to, the next steps would be to look at how in older children it would relate to other executive abilities. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I'm just, and this is not a criticism at all. It's just because it's such a hot topic, as you probably know. How much do you think that you are measuring I know that I, I understand what you said at the beginning about the overlap, um, but how much do you think you're actually measuring inhibitory control or the development of a broader effortful attentional capacity that, that of course expands across anything that we might call executive? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think that, as you know, in young children, when, when we, you know, people have done factor analyses and quite often, the factor analysis just comes out with one executive function factor. And quite often we just talk about executive function um, in singular. 
Um, but I find that from a task, when you're trying to develop tasks, you have to try and operationalize what you're measuring. Um, and, 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 and if you sort of have some kind of very general, like, oh, it's something about controlling behavior and stuff, it makes it very difficult to, to, to create a task. Uh, so I think the answer to your question from my perspective is, is exactly what I also highlighted with uh, Peters and colleagues. We need to do that validation gradually. And unfortunately, I don't think there are any easy solutions uh, because we just need to establish that we're not just measuring maybe general cognitive development or something like that. And that that's, it's really a gradual, it's really a gradual process. And it might well be that the answer in the end um, is that it is just one thing. Um, it's, it's just a general control factor that predict later outcomes. But I, I sort of feel that if we don't try and develop the tasks to measure specifically a function we're interested in, then we don't really know then we know even less about what we're measuring with that task, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I, I agree. I was just interested to see what your answer was. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's great. I'll be quiet now. Great. OK, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, next up would be Hilary, please. Hi, thanks for a, a great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is actually pretty related to uh, the last question. Um, because I was also thinking about how you can distinguish between developmental changes and um, inhibitory control versus, you know, learning the rules of and successfully doing the task. I um, mean, so I was just wondering if you could say more about how you trained the youngest children and infants how to do the task. Um, and, and maybe, you know, um, a related question to that is, was there any improvement in the task across trials? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. So I, I, I sort of mentioned that initially I, I sort of aimed for a task for about two-year-olds because I thought, you know, that's it's already quite difficult to test a two-year-old in this kind of task. And, and I had a sort of different design for like the infant version where the parent would point and help and this. And then it turned out that when we put the touch screen in front of the infants, they just wanted to tap the screen. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, um, like actually, I think everybody in my team and everybody who's worked with this task will agree that it's it's quite amazing um, how uh, babies and toddlers just love touch screens. So, um, so they don't really need any training as soon as they realize that when I touch the screen, they want to touch the screen. Um, but I uh, we do see some uh, we do see some very subtle uh, training effects. Um, not anything substantial, but when we do the test retest, we can see on those prepotent trials. Um, the performance in those trials uh, increases a bit, um, but uh, we don't actually train them. There isn't the, like a, like there's a very short uh, practice phase where we just have the smiley in the, the button with a smiley in the middle, just to give the, them the experience of, of when I press the screen, something happens, but usually just a couple of those trials and they want to tap the screen. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Julia? Please. Um, hi. Um, yeah, thank you for the talk. It's actually very interesting because in my lab, we're developing a go-no-go -no -go task that spans across different ages. So I found it very interesting. And what we often encounter as one of the difficulties was is to control for reward learning or those different underlying processes. So I was wondering, considering that your adult task doesn't have that reward component, whether you're um, worried about the reward learning driving basically learning and um, the responses of the of the younger children and, and how would you resolve that in relation to the adult version of the test that doesn't have that? Yeah, so I think that um, so in the younger children, we we need to have I mean, we need to have some kind of reward to make it fun. But I agree with you with the adult version. Um, like I think the adult version we do well, well we developed developed it primarily because we wanted to look at, you know, is it possible to have this task that has the same structure, but it's not the, cho it's not the choice of task, I think, if I wanted to measure inhibitory control in adults, because actually in young adults, they're, they're sort of have peak performance, they like make almost no errors, we do see a difference in reaction time, uh, and it's a good point about the reward learning. Um, um, the reason we took the rewards out was simply to speed the task up to make it more difficult. But it's definitely one of those aspects. I think you touch on something really important there. It's like, you know, I'd like to keep the task as similar as possible, but obviously there are just differences in how we present the task to children. We just 
show them something that they want to play, whereas with adults, we instruct them. And I think really to be completely sure that we're meshing the same thing, uh, well, we have, we'd have to test it, but also manipulate those, those variables. So I think, you, I think you're right about that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, excuse my pronunciation here, uh, Lilia? Yeah, hi. Uh, Hello. Thanks, yeah, hi. Uh, okay. Thanks, Carla, for your talk. Um, I actually, I've, I am a PhD student at Uppsala University, and I have a bit of experience with administering this task. Great. And, it, <laughs> and I can testify to the fact that it's uh, a really fun task to do with, with kids. Uh, and I kind of just wanted to ask what you think about it uh, in terms of if it might tap into something with emotion regulation or more hot versions of executive function uh, due to the fact that the kids are really excited and happy while they're doing the task. Um, and then again, it's, it's probably hard not to have excitement and fun while testing kids on executive functions. So what are yeah, your so, thoughts about this? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I, I wouldn't define it as a hot executive function task as such, because there isn't sort of, we're not saying, we're not putting it in front of the kids and saying, oh, you can't touch that fun thing on the screen. Uh, but you're right that we do see that, um, especially I'd say from about 16, around 16 months of age, that, uh, that, that some children are perseverating a lot. They're just, they're just not, they just keep pressing the same button and we do see some signs of frustration there. So I don't, I can't rule out that there is an element, um, that there is an element of frustration um, in the task. Um, but um, there's a specific design feature of the task that I actually didn't mention in the talk, but um, in the very first version of the task, what happened was that um, when they pressed the wrong button, the stimuli just disappeared. Um, and um, for those of you who've tested two-year-olds, it can be really fun to tease the experiment and just press um, the blank button so everything just disappears all the time. So what we did was to just leave that button on the blank button. So basically, there's absolutely no reward associated with pressing the wrong button. It just gets, um, it just gets a bit boring, really. So I don't think there's a huge hot aspect, except maybe um, there are some kids. Uh, it's not. It's, it's maybe like five, ten percent who perseverate very strongly, and there's definitely some signs of frustration because they just. Why is, why, is, why, is, why is nothing happening, you know? I want animation to come up. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carl. I'm gonna take a question from the chat. This is from um, Spray Malati. Uh, is there any study uh, like this that have used um, special educational needs um, kids that you know of? No, there isn't, but I'd love for somebody to do this because um, it would be like obviously the, the task is to it has been developed to be used with very young children um, and it would be great. Yeah, it would be great if it could be applied to that kind of context and 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 it's exactly the kind of thing I was hoping the task would be used for. I mean, I've been testing typical children because I'm very interested in in how these early trajectories may predict all sorts of things later on, but it would be very interesting to see um, what what we could measure with a task in special education needs children, yeah. Okay, thank you. And if somebody wanted to do that, they would just reach out to you, would they, via typical methods? Yeah, get in touch. Um, there, is, there is a preprint out. I, I think it's actually still on the screen. Yeah. And the, um, the code is uh, for the task is freely available. Okay. Uh, does need a, a programmer to set it up, I have to say, but there's also a demo version. Okay. Which, Really be used um, to test, but it, it, you can try the task out. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, next person was uh, Michael Thomas. He's gone. Are you there, Michael? Hi there, Carla. I am. I am there. If you can hear me. Uh, <laughs> great talk. Really interesting. Yeah. I mean, my question has sort of been answered already, and, and it was a question about how this kind of task relates to emotion regulation. Uh, and mm -hmm. so if you think about the marshmallow test, that, that is um, sort of impulse control is kind of hot uh, executive functions. And, and um, what do you think the, re the developmental relationship is between these hot behavioral control aspects mm -hmm. versus 
uh, your task, which is which is like stimulated by novelty and interest, but but you wouldn't really view it as an emotion regulation task. Yeah, so I think that um, when you look at the literature, um, the hot and cool aspects um, of executive function tend to be correlated at about 0.5. So I think there's no doubt that there's some kind of a relationship. Um, and, and I don't think, like, given that, the, as you say, there's this reward aspect and novelty, um, and when you then don't get the reward because nothing's happening, there's an element of frustration. Uh, what I'm not so sure about is what would what what would drive what. And that would be something that would be quite interesting to look at. Like if the child gets frustrated, it might actually prevent them from starting to perform the task well. Um, so I don't think they're completely independent. But I also don't think we see a lot of frustration when we're running this task. I mean, you can ask uh, some of my colleagues who've also run it, um, like nine out of 10 children are just playing the task. And, and if, if they are persevering, perseverating a lot, it's like kind of a bit boring, but as soon as they find the, the, the smiley again and the animation um, comes up, they tend to be happy. So, so I think that these aspects are related, especially in early childhood. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that I think, yeah, well, that I'm hoping to look more at. And in fact, we did, um, we did run some hot executive function tasks um, although we had to stop, as you know, we had to stop the study early. Great, thank you. Uh, one from the chat, Carla, from uh, Nikki Andredu. Are there differences between gender slash sex in IC? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I, I have to say, I haven't looked much um, into this because in infants, um, in infants, there tends to be very limited differences um, on, inhibit on inhibitory control tasks, but in toddlerhood, um, we start we do start to see some differences, and, and, and generally girls do a little better than boys. Uh, but I haven't looked at it in our data yet. Okay, thank you very much. Um, another um, so Paul Matus from the um, the chat. Would you like to ask a question, please? Hi, Carla. Yeah. Hello, Paul. Hi, Paul. Great to hear you give this chart. Hi, that was really nice, rigorous, and systematic work. I was just wondering. Um, uh, as we know that the uh, executive functions and, and, and selective attention are very tightly linked, what type of task would you imagine um, or what type of uh, um, selective attention process would you like to investigate um, as, as an urgent one to investigate and at what age you would think that's, that would, uh, there, there could be some interesting, um, yeah, uh, no relationships and then relationships or perhaps the other way around, uh, uh, you know, some um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Where, when would you think this, these would arise and where would you go first? So, so that's, a, that's a very good question. I don't know if I can give you a good answer, but I think that especially um, towards the end of the first year of life, um, there's some really um, interesting individual differences in attention. So, um, um, and this is just completely anecdotal, but when we, we have a set of eye tracking tasks as well, and we do see that some children are very, um, well, they're very flexible in the way they allocate their att attention and other, uh, and other infants are very sort of sticky and find it quite hard to move their attention. And I'm fascinated by this, but I don't quite know what it means yet. But I think, I don't know, have you, have you got any ideas for like good selective attention tasks? Because it'd be very interesting to hear what uh, you have to say. No, I just I think my, my thoughts were, I, I mean, I really like the task and I really like the systematic approach. I would love to see, uh, you know, how, how the cold uh, ex uh, inhibitory control compares to the hot one, etc. So I'm very much looking forward to what, what you guys are going to produce uh, soon. I'm just wondering, you know, maybe uh, as, as we know that like the familiarity with the, with the, with the stimuli, etc. is making, is, is allowing us to see um, certain control abilities much earlier than we would have thought. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe visual search, maybe these just, uh, ah, you know, okay. the Posnerian tasks, but uh, just something that you could perhaps take as early as, um, as you did with this task, but uh, yeah, supporting yourself with, uh, with, some, with, some, well, with eye tracking or perhaps smears, et cetera. Just, I was wondering where, where you would imagine to see some interesting uh, relationships and differences, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know if this answers your questions, but the, but like this is obviously just one task out of like a battery of tasks we've been working on. So there's also some working memory tasks. We're also looking at focused attention. And I think that from my in my mind, what I want to do 
is whenever I create a task, I'd like to try and keep it as similar as possible. As I explained, I just think that like we should at least try. I think where there's potentially a big issue uh, sometimes is that quite often we have to at some point uh, switch between screen-based and either manual or touch screen. And that I feel is quite a big shift. Uh, but for visual attention, I, I, I don't see why we couldn't continue to do something on, for example, an eye tracker. And my suggestion there would be to, 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 to you know, think like, so, so, so the process is think about what you want to measure. Are you interested in whether um, the babies get particular dis particularly distracted or whether they can take in as many different stimuli and move their eyes around a screen, whatever your question is, and then try and stick with that and change as little as possible. That, that, that would be my, my approach. I, I definitely share your approach as, as you know. So that's, uh, yeah, that would be very cool to see something. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, next question uh, is Polly, please. Hi, Carla. Um, thanks, thanks so much for a really nice talk. Um, I'm really excited to have you um, come to Bristol. Um, I'm really oh. interested in um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the bilingual advantage of an executive functioning or just cognition in general. And so I wondered if you had any sort of background or well, yes, yeah, background language um, information on, on the children that you tested and whether that's something you might want to look at in the future. Oh, that's a good question and a very controversial topic, um, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> um, because I know that, you know, there's, you know, both evidence for and against. I do, um, we do collect data um, on what languages uh, children are exposed to in the home, although it's just part of our sort of general background data. So it's not very detailed in any way of what the exposure is, um, uh, but it's something that we could look at. I don't know whether I would have any particular predictions with the asset. Um, I, I know that there was um, the study by um, Kovacs and Mailer quite a few years ago now, um, showing that, uh, I think it was at seven months that um, infants had this sort of more ability to um, learn a reward um, association and look to one location and then there was a switch and they had to look to the location. And, and they found that the bilingual infants did better, but uh, I think that has not been replicated. So um, I think um, just as a general point, if we want to study this, as, as with everything, we need to think about what the mechanism would be. Why would, why would what would give them that advantage? And, and especially at that young age um, and the sort of mechanism behind it, yeah. Do you, what, what kind of population are your, how diverse in terms of their language background are they? Uh, well, it's, it's an Oxford population, so, yeah. <laughs> so they are pretty high SES, but there is quite a lot of um, bilingualism in, in Oxford because a lot of uh, academics and um, many from Europe and other places in the world. So I think there's a, my guess would be about 15% are bilinguals, so yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Amanda, you're next. Um, I just want, sorry if I missed this. Um, I really liked your study, by the way. It was really interesting. Did you take a family history of ADHD? Because given the fact that it's highly heritable and very undiagnosed in women um, in particular, I wondered if you'd looked into that or had any idea whether any of the infants that you were seeing might be potentially, or, or people who might potentially have that and also what influence that might have had on the outcome of your adult study too. Yes, so in the, in the infant study, we collect a sort of basic background data on whether there's um, ADHD or ASD in the family. Um, again, nothing overly detailed, uh, but we have got the information there. Obviously, when we recruit the babies into the study, they are way too young for a di diagnosis like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do collect uh, quite a lot of questionnaires and we're still collecting questionnaires, um, looking not so much specifically at ADHD, but uh, more broad executive function difficulties. Um, and we hopefully we'll be continuing to do that because I think you're right that, well, there's a diagnosis of ADHD, but, but as you mentioned, there might be a lot of un under diagnosis or even just like a lot within the normal spectrum. Mm. Uh, and I'm quite interested in, in, in this kind of variation that's not restricted necessarily to a diagnosis, but to something that's 
that say the child has a bit of problems and it's just enough to make them struggle in school, but they would not get an ADHD diagnosis. And that's exactly the kind of, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm interested in. But I didn't collect this data in the, in the adult data set, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll switch my attention to the chat. So a question um, relatively similar to what was just being asked, actually, and just one before. Um, it's from Rachel Huntman. Have you considered the ways in which it is culturally sensitive or cultural adaptations that would be important in sampling different groups? E.g. how salient is the happy face stimuli for other populations? For cultural manipulation and mechanism? Yeah, that's a really nice question. <laughs> uh, I haven't adapted it for other... Um, other cultures but like you know it would like it would be amazing if somebody looked at this but uh yeah I would be really interested to see this because as I mentioned with uh babies we I really didn't expect they'd even do anything with the screen but they just for some reason like I mean obviously an iPad has not been around in evolutionary terms for very long um so um but nevertheless it just seems so intuitive um, to even even we actually asked the parents whether uh, the babies have been exposed to touch screens and most of the time they haven't. So parents keep that away from their babies. Um, but even so, it, it doesn't seem to matter. They just go straight to the screen. So it'd be really interesting to see whether in a different culture, perhaps a culture without access to anything like this, whether that would make any sense um, to them. And I don't think that this that the smiley is, is necessarily the important thing here. I think it could be any other symbol that was attractive or friendly. Um, um, it's just that it was very easy to say, press the happy face, touch the happy face, and it's very intuitive and a very minimal instruction. But absolutely, I think, I, I think it would be interesting to look at this in all, other cultures. And I think that the task could potentially be adapted um, to what's most appropriate in that, that culture. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, question, um, question from Alan Joseph. Um, can the test be delivered remotely? Well, that's a good question. It is actually kind of delivered remotely uh, okay. because um, Henrik Dvaustal, who's programmed the task, uh, is in Norway. <laughs> um, and uh, the task actually works um, by um, you have um, an you have the iPad and then you have another device. We just use an iPhone, but it could be any device. And the experimenter actually controls the task and starts the trials from the phone. Mm. Um, and this all goes through the Wi-Fi, sends it to the iPad, and uh, that's how we control it. So it could be. And I'd love to say that I could just give you the link and you could all use it, but um, unfortunately I can't just for the reason that. Um, um, that Henry doesn't uh, want to <laughs> want to have lots of people uh, <laughs> talk from him all the time, but we are hoping to um, work on some kind of way that this could be done. It's really just a um, what can you what can you call it? Like it's a practical bottleneck that we need to solve more than uh, it, it can. It's that's how it's basically done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Louise, uh, Louise please. Hi, Carla. Thank, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm, and I don't know whether you actually said this and I, and I missed it, but when are you planning to go ab above the kind of uh, toddler into the early childhood age range? Yeah, so, so I feel that there's like a version of the task missing and we're hoping to develop this version, um, actually, hopefully this year, because we're still hoping to children although it would be nice if we could one day but um, um, I'd like to develop a version that's targeted at the preschool age um, what we find is that um, <coughs> when get to, uh, two and a half years children start to be at ceiling on on this on the infant and toddler version they find it quite easy um, so I think we need a version that just is a li little faster um, so the animations are a little shorter because this kind of response inhibition is really sensitive to the speed you're responding at. So having the repetitive potent trials relatively fast um, is, is the kind of thing that will help uh, make the task harder. And that, that is sort of a bit the missing link at the moment. So uh, the plan is, is to develop um, 
version for preschoolers. Okay, great. All right, I shall look out for that. <laughs> Okay, brilliant. We are nearing, well, it's five o'clock. Uh, just some feedback from the chat is to um, commend you on your talk, Carla. It was, it was super well received and thank you so much for that. And also your response you. to the questions were uh, greatly received too. Um, and obviously, uh, I'm just checking now, we have no more hands that have been raised. So from that, um, oh, sorry, Iraz has just given me a clap symbol. So um, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so on behalf of the um, SEND team, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Just for interest, there was around about 150 people in, the, in your talk today, so um, that was really nicely well received. Thank you so much, and uh, I wish you all the very best for um, your evening and your future research. I'll, soon, I'll be certainly looking, after your, um, looking at your preprints, because I'm interested in, in kind of motor variability and, and, um, and attention. So, so, um, thank you so much, Carla. Thank and, you. Uh, take care, and we'll see you next week for the rest of the um, Sun Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think you have to actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, let me just. Um... Yeah, let me do that. I can easily do this one. So, one sec. Okay, thank you. Uh... Some reason I can't. Um, there you go. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. I will um, probably head off as well now. Yep. No problem. Bye. Thank you very much. And we'll, we're going to post the um, the video on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow or uh, early next week. But thank you so much for your time, Carla. Nice Brilliant. to meet you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.